Haas is a PhD candidate in the Department of Statistics at Purdue University. He works as a research assistant for the School of Nursing, providing statistical support for gerontological and health services research. His dissertation work is focused on divisional credit modeling for team sports. During the fall and winter seasons, he is employed by the Athletic Communications Department as the game day state crew and tutor for volleyball, football, and men's and women's basketball. He has consulted for the Purdue football in recruiting analytics and for DevGro in their production of a football win probability calculator. Zachary received a BA in statistics and economics from Case Western Reserve University where he played defensive back for the football team. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon. Uh, so I'll talk about division of credit modeling for team sports. So this comes out of my uh, dissertation work at Purdue. This direction. So first, I'll talk uh, an overview of what I mean by division of credit modeling, because that's not necessarily a term that's used. That's what I've decided to call it, and it's something that is done. And then I'll discuss a specific application of, of that methodology to volleyball. Hang on, click here shortly. Uh, so the idea is that you're going to have some kind of outcome that's happening during gameplay. Uh, you're going to have some measure of contribution, and then you're going to use a relative value of that contribution to, to split the credit directly amongst the players. Uh, in terms of potential outcomes, uh, I think the most obvious are, are to split up a win directly or to split up the points directly. And you can think of the plus minus that's used in basketball or hockey as, as an idea of, of a way to split points. Uh, there's been work basketball splitting up wins and, and elsewhere based on box score statistics. You can also use derivatives of outcomes and there's reasons to do that which I'll talk about here shortly uh, using like a change in win probability or a change in expected points. Uh, there's a nice paper out there giving a, an overview and there was talks I think this morning about it as well using football data to do win probability. Uh, there's been work in the NBA doing win probability. There's been a lot of work in hockey uh, doing change in point probability. And the reason I want to use a derivative instead of just uh, the more obvious wins or points is it can address uh, a non-independence that you'll see in consecutive plays. Particularly in, in football and baseball you'll see that. So I've got a little baseball diagram to, to illustrate what I mean by that. In baseball you have at a minimum three players coming to bat. So you have in a sense three plays in a row on offense. If at most the, the first batter can produce one run. That's the most they can do. Uh, if they get on base and they don't score, uh, they didn't produce a run, but the second batter can now produce at most two runs. So some value must have been produced, and so looking at uh, a change in expected runs is a way to capture that, so that's why you, you would use a derivative. It also fills in scoring sparsity. You think of football, there's a lot of plays where no points occur, but value is produced. You move the ball down the field, you're now closer to scoring, and so that's a way to, to value those, those non-scoring plays. Uh, it's also been used as a way to control for context. Uh, there was a paper in basketball that looked at win probability, and the idea was we want to control for the context of the game. So if a player comes in, the game's already been decided, they're up by 30 points, there's two minutes to play, you put in your reserves. Any stats that are produced at that point are, are pretty empty in terms of producing a win. So when you use a change in win probability, it's not going to give much credit to those players that are at the end of the game. So those are reasons why you might want to use a derivative outcome uh, to divide amongst the players. Uh, some problems that might arise with using a derivative, uh, there's some extra modeling, you're produce, you need to estimate what's the win probability for this situation, what the points for this situation, so it's a little more effort. Uh, the end of game can be a little funny with win probability, so here's a little toy example. We'll say, you know, they're down towards the end of the game, in, in football, they're setting up to kick a really long field goal, Maybe there's two seconds left, they're down by two. If they, if they make the field goal, they've won the game. Or if they throw a Hail Mary and they get a touchdown, they've won the game. And so they might go from having a 20% chance to having won the game. So you have a jump of, say, 80%. And that's, that's how valuable the last play was. And contextually, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, that play is really valuable. They went from being behind to, to winning the game. But in terms of, of comparing players or, or the value, if that's not the way you want to do it, if you're not really controlling for context, uh, that's going to cause trouble. If you look at a uh, change in, in points or point probability, uh, Routley did a dissertation on hockey where he looked at using a Markov model to value player actions. Uh, sometimes you get in a situation where 
something that you would normally consider to be a good thing uh, will give you a negative point probability. And so one thing he pointed out was in certain situations when uh, one player's down a man and the other player's team's at full strength and a, a goalie blocks a shot, he'll actually get a negative point probability because the chance of, of a, a rebound shot off that block is pretty high. And so if, if you don't like those kind of interpretations, that'd be another reason why you wouldn't want to use a derivative or, or at least take care. In terms of contribution in the literature, uh, there's two main ways to do it. Uh, one is to use player presence, and the idea is better players are going to be in the game, better things are going to happen. So we want to correlate those two things. And the, the key assumption there is you're assuming that players have some constant impact across uh, the data that you're going to try to estimate. You need data that tracks substitutions. Uh, that can tend to be a little easier to get, depending on the sport. Uh, a little easier to, to value that contribution, but it's going to be less informative. And, and so you'll see some works that will split it up by offense and defense and try to get a little bit of a picture of what they're contributing. Uh, but in general, it will be a little less informative. Uh, the second major way to, to value contribution is to look directly at player actions. So you're going to need uh, a little more in-depth data. And your assumption there is that these actions have some, some value. You want to value those actions. A little harder to get the data off and a little more work to clean it, uh, but it's going to be more informative about exactly what a player's contributing. So once we, we've settled on what we're going to measure, uh, we need some way to value it. And so if you think of player presence, uh, a plus minus model would be saying everybody has equal uh, share of contribution. Doesn't matter who's on the court, they're, they're contributing equal. If you think of an adjusted plus minus model, you're saying each player is different. I want to estimate their impact uh, relative to the other players and the context. Uh, network modeling, I know there was a talk on that earlier today, and there's been some papers about using that in basketball. And if you do it in a certain way, you can get a parameter that says, here's how valuable this player was. Uh, in the adjusted plus minus literature, you'll, you'll see problems uh, with multicollinearity. If you do a regression model, and and certain terms always appear together, certain players are always playing together, you're going to have trouble in your estimates. And, and since coaches are going to put a lot of strategy in the way they put players in the game, they, there's multicollinearity. You wouldn't put five point guards on the floor very often in basketball. Uh, there's certain players that just aren't going to play very much. You want your starters to get lots of time. So that's an issue if you go down that route. Uh, looking at player actions, uh, if things happen in sequence, you can use a Markov model, and that's been done uh, to value actions. That's been done in hockey and volleyball. Uh, Engelman, 2011, proposed using a finite state machine to divide credit. And it, it looks kind of like a Markov model, but then he adds a bunch of different parameters into it and, and estimate it iteratively. Uh, if you think of war and, and baseball, we'll use often kind of an empir empirical expectation of what usually happens and then what happened in your case on that flight. Uh, once we have some measure of contribution, we, we can split credit. So if we think of a plus minus, all we're doing is saying you get one share out of how many players are on the court. And, and so that might not tell you a lot, but that's the, the most basic way to do it. If we have some parameter, like a adjusted plus minus model, we could do something where we, we normalize based on that parameter. And uh, it, it may you may have to condition on the outcome. For example, if a player has a relatively low parameter or a negative parameter, you wouldn't want to give them less credit on a bad play, so you'd have to invert things. But you can play around with that, and the basic idea is you're, you're using the model parameters to divide the credit. When you have action values, similarly, uh, how much value did you produce on that play divided by your, your team's total? So we're just normalizing things so that we can split the credit uh, based on what players are doing. So some kind of properties that come out of, of doing it in this way uh, when you are splitting uh, credit, say wins or points, or their derivatives, uh, you're putting everybody on the same scale. Uh, so that's illustrated great in, in uh, baseball's runs above replacement. You can compare the, uh, someone who pitches to the DH only bats, and they're on, on the same scale, so that's nice. Uh, you're often able to, to build in context, especially in the values. Uh, many models will build some kind of Baseline, and the idea there is we want to assess efficiency. We don't want just a raw metric. How much opportunity did you have to produce these runs or, or these, these wins? Uh, the outcome is conserved. So that means every time I give credit to one side, I'm giving blame to the other side. So if we sum across everybody in the league, we'll get a, a total of zero. It's a zero-sum game. 
Uh, you look at a specific team, you sum all the players, you get the team's total. So it, you get the total number of wins or total number of points they produce. Uh, it's also an additive, which means we can split it up in a lot of different ways based on what we want to know about. Uh, how many runs do they produce at home, how many do they produce away, or how many do they produce in this lineup versus that lineup, that sort of thing. So now I'll talk about uh, my application to volleyball. So this grows out of having type stats for volleyball and needing a, a dissertation topic. They're more than willing to, to give me some data and some ideas. So I'm, I'm hoping to eventually implement this in a way that's going to be useful for them, but for now it's, it's mostly just a demonstration. Uh, so we graded two games, about 331 plays, uh, 12 players for the, for the same team. One was a win, one was a loss. Uh, as an outcome, we're using points. In volleyball, they use rally scoring, so that means every time there's a serve, somebody scores. So every play has a point. Uh, that's the same in college volleyball and in most international play. Uh, we're assuming points are equally valuable at this point, and our end metric is going to be on the net uh, points won, or net points contributed. Kind of like the plus, exactly like the plus minus. So if you tend to do more good things, you'll have a positive score. If you tend to do more bad things, you should have a negative score. We get to use action grades, which is something that isn't used uh, across, or isn't commonly available, I should say. A lot of play-by-play -play data will have some actions in sports, but not necessarily how quality the action was. Uh, volleyball has a program called Data Volley, and what happens is someone will sit down, they'll watch game film, and they'll say, okay, uh, player 10 served, and that was a three. Uh, player to dug the ball, and that was a one, and they'll, they'll have a scale. I think the default is five, but you can set it to whatever you want. I'm going to use three, because I find that an easy way to grade. Uh, something that's particularly advantageous towards scoring a point is what was considered average, or it was a disadvantageous action. So just a three-level scale. Uh, what's really exciting about this uh, data source is that there's a company called Volumetrics, and there may be others. Uh, well, basically what they do is they'll install cameras in your gym, they'll film the games, the film gets sent off, they grade it for you, they send it back. If enough teams in your league or conference subscribe, they give you everyone's graded film. So you can do uh, some neat things that way. So in terms of evaluating act these actions, uh, this was proposed in the literature just use the Markov model, and it makes a lot of sense because volleyball actions uh, happen in a row, at least the ones that are graded. Somebody serves, the other side will try to dig it, set it, attack, uh, the other side will try to block it, and they'll, they'll go back and forth. And so in this Markov model, uh, the circles are the states. Here I've removed the action values to make it easier to look at. Let's go like there we go. If I can use that properly. There we go. The circles are the states, or that, the actions that are happening. Uh, red is the serving team, blue is the non-serving team. And the reason I do that is to pin the actions to uh, no particular team. And in college volleyball, what I'm seeing is when you're serving, the chances of you scoring are actually much lower. Uh, so we're building a little bit of the context into the action values that way. The arrows, all of the intersecting lines are the, the possible transitions that we're allowing in the model. Uh, so you don't see anything going back to a serve, because once a serve happens, uh, it's not going to repeat. There's one serve per play. The rectangles are the absorbing states. At the end, someone's going to win the point, someone's going to lose the point. And what we're estimating here is what's the probability if I have a really great serve, I get a point at the end. Or if I had a really bad block, what's the chance I get a point at the end. And that's how I'm going to value the actions with those absorption probabilities. Uh, we did it in a Bayesian way, which just means at the end we get a distribution for our parameter. So here I pictured serving. So red I have, uh, if you do a bad serve, how often does that end in a point? And that's our estimate. So it's, the mean is around 18%. So that 18% is what I'm using as the, the value for a bad serve. Then we have an average serve, and it, it's higher up the scale of probably ending a point. So it's, it's better. It's more valuable for scoring a point. And then uh, an extra good serve. And throughout, I condition on the outcome. So if I'm valuing a bad serve and we won the point, it's worth 18. If we had a bad serve and we lost the point, it's 1 minus 0.18. So I, I call it, you, you, get, you end up with most of the blame that way. So you can still get credit as long as what happened was, was good. 
And so if we have these action values, we want to divide the point. So this is just trying to illustrate that. Uh, I give a little bit of, of credit for being on the court, and there's two reasons for that. And it, it looks like an arbitrary value. There's a little bit behind choosing it, but it is somewhat arbitrary. Uh, one is that it helps capture some of the intangibles. So the bigger you make that value, the more credit a player gets for just being on court. And, and players do do things that aren't measured. Uh, sometimes you'll have two players go up for an attack and the center will set it one way, but because the other player went up, they drew some of the defense over. Where they position themselves will, will affect how the other team attacks. So they're doing things that aren't measured. There is some intangible value. It also allows plays where no player on that team had an action to still divide the point. So that way we still have it conserved. Uh, if, uh, Team A serves it in the net, Team B is not going to do anything because the ball never made it over there. So that will still allow them to, to split the, the point equally. So as an example, we'll say player A had an average serve over the net, player B on the other side had an average dig, player C then set it up, and player B had a great attack and they won the point. So everything kind of adds up. Player B gets credit for their dig, plus the credit for their attack, plus the credit for their court presence, and then we just normalize it. So the setter would just would get credit for just their set alone and court presence, if normalized, and the other players just get credit for being on the court. So if we look at the result, the one who did the most actions gets the most credit, who did the setting gets the next most credit, and the other players get a little bit for being out there. So in that way, we've divided the point amongst the participants. And so we can do a lot of things I call these observed credit proportions. We can do a lot of things with these credit proportions. And so here, I've, I've tossed a little math formula out there. Uh, and the idea is we want to control for roll. And so we can view these proportions using a Dirichlet model. And we can look at each lineup as a Dirichlet model. And the idea is we want to say, on average, do you contribute more in this lineup or you, do you contribute less? What's your average behavior? And I highlight this just to say uh, we stitch across lineups, so we, we give each player a single parameter for points won and a single parameter for points lost. And the idea is at the end, these alpha values, if they're bigger, uh, that player had more opportunity to affect the game. Uh, I also forgot to mention, at this point, we removed action qualities. And so we're not saying how well did you do, we're saying how many opportunities do you get. So if, if serving is really valuable and you get to serve a lot, uh, then you'll have a higher parameter. Or if attacking is most valuable and you get to attack a lot, then your parameter will be higher. And if we normalize it for a particular lineup, we'll get back to a proportion, and that says, when these six players are on the court, how, how much of the opportunity do you get relative to the others? So it's, it's a, a way to control for expected contribution or expected opportunity. Uh, we also want to control for play context. Serving, there's a difference, it's about 15% difference between serving and non-serving in terms of scoring a point. We built that into the action values. Uh, home field, there's a difference. How strong your opponent is, there's a difference in whether or not you score. Uh, so we want to build that in. So this is a really simple model. Uh, ideally, as, as the data grows, we'll be able to build a more robust context model. Uh, but we just use logistic regression for point one. We can toss in there whatever predictors we want. And we can get for each play a probability that uh, the team of interest wins the point. Once we've done that, we can create what I call value expected. How many points, uh, given what lineups you were in and the context you were in, how many points did we expect you to contribute? And so we have some share of the point will be considered to be won, and the probability that the point was lost will be the share that we say your team will lose that point. Given that you won the point, we, we plug in your role. If you typically have a big role on points won, we'll expect you to score a lot in that game. And we do the same thing for points lost. If you typically have a big role on points lost, say you're blocking, which is a low probability thing, then you'll have a bigger share here. So in this way, we get a score that doesn't use the actual gameplay outside of, of the lineups that were used to say, here's how many points, based on your role in the context, we thought you should produce. And so we, we end up with, by final metric, a credit above the value expected, or the cave rating. And it's just the difference between your credit proportion, just the raw value that you produced, minus what we thought you produced based on uh, your opportunity. I like it because it avoids the double use of the data creating a baseline, uh, we can adjust for some game context, and the idea is that we should be able to spot unusual performances. Are there players that have improved quite a bit? 
uh, relative to what they've been before. Are players struggling against certain rotations or in certain situations uh, relative to their role? Do we need to make some kind of adjustment? So that's what we're looking for. So here I've just got some results that I'll run through kind of quick to illustrate. It's two games, so the inference you can make off that is not going to be great, but I'll talk through it as, as if it was, uh, just to illustrate what I'm going for. So I have each of the players masked with a letter in a column, so I'll, I'll talk about player B uh, just to illustrate. We have two games, game one, game two. The credit in game one for this player, they were they produced four tenths of a point. Second game, 7.7 tenths of a point. And if you're reading real close, things aren't gonna add up because they're all rounded to, to tenths, and I didn't, didn't make them all square. So in total, eight points. So it looks like this player did really great in game two and, and not so hot in game one. If we calculate value expected, uh, it's smaller for the first game than the second game. So in, in the cave, as far as the cave's concerned, this player was consistent across the two games, once we control for context and role. Now we're also looking for to spot players that were unusual. So the, the highest value right here was player G, and she only played in, in the harder game. And having followed the team for several seasons, this was a first year player. This was about mid-season. Uh, her role expanded quite a bit in this game. She was put in to replace someone that was struggling and, and did average, uh, which was an improvement for what she had done previously. And she would go on to be one of the, the best players on the team. So, you know, I might be reading too far into it from two games, but that's the sort of thing that we're hoping uh, the metric captures. Ideally, we can also do some team stuff. So here in the black, if we look at game one, they lost by seven, but we can get kind of an expected value. Once we build up uh, a really good model, this will be more meaningful, but they were expected to lose by 17 points. And so, even though they lost, they beat expectations by 10 points, which would be a way to more finely uh, grade team progress. And since it's additive, we can split it up in a, in a lot of different ways. So here I have it by action. Uh, the team in total lost five points to serving. Serving is a lower probability thing. But player D contributed 1.7 points to serving. So now we know just from this that player D served really well in those two games. If we compare players across an action, we have to be a little careful. Here we say player B lost three points to blocking. Player F only lost a tenth of a point to blocking. Player F must have been a great blocker, or did she have less opportunity to fail? If we sum up, sum up the absolute values of the credit proportion, we get credit opportunity. Player B had 12 points opportunity to block. Player F had about 12 points opportunity to block. So we divide the two, we kind of look at efficiency that way, and we see even though they're both negative, player F had the better result. She was more efficient blocker. She did better blocking. Uh, I highlight over here players A and B. Uh, these two did most of the setting, with player B doing much, much more of the setting. Uh, player A was a little more efficient, and I highlight that because player A was a first year player who would replace player B as a setter the next year when, when player B graduated. So hopefully you'd be able to, to get a good feel for whether or not those kind of switch, who's gonna fill whose role uh, based on who's, who's showing good progress. Uh, so in summary, I've, I've introduced what I call a division of credit metric, and it's something that's done, uh, baseball especially does this, uh, but the idea is that you value play by an outcome, uh, you measure and value the contribution of the players, and so there's, there's some modeling there, and then you divide the outcome based on the relative contribution. Uh, the cave metric is a specific application to NCAA volleyball, and I'm, I'm excited to, to dig into some of that volumetrics data, hopefully, and, and build something a little more robust and, and useful. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? Why did you need to have the plays graded? Yes, action quality, yeah. yeah. So you could just use serve or, or dig or sat as opposed to that was a really good and so it provides a little more final, finer detail on who's contributing to what. So you think of someone who's going to, to dig the ball, and it, they dig it, and it creams off backwards. And so the next person has to run back and try, try and save it, and it's everything they can do just to get the ball back over the net. Versus they, they pass it right to the net, the center's right there, they set it, uh, they can set up the attack really well. And so we want to make sure that even if they win that point, that first dig doesn't get as much credit as the second. 
incredible amount of effort and value to get volumetrics to come in and grade the data, right? The contract yep. must be expensive, the yes. time consuming. It's uh, how yep. much so if I don't grade any place, yep. I can do right away. What is it? Yeah. So how much do I gain or lose either way? Yes. Yeah. It's a great question. Uh, so there is another data source. Uh, there's something called Stat Crew for, for college volleyball, and you can get just the actions. Uh, it happens live as the game is going on, so there's there's errors. I I, I type that, so I know there's there's errors sometimes. <laughs> so you can do that, absolutely. Uh, there, most teams in the conference that I'm aware of are already paid for it, whether this model exists or not. So I'm trying to take advantage of, of something that already exists. As to whether or not you'll get really really different scores, I haven't tested it, so I'd be making up an answer. But it's a great question, something worth testing, especially if you're trying to make that financial decision. I think the contract's like $7,000 a year. So I don't know if that is on the high or low end of, for some teams, obviously, that's way too much, and others, it's feasible. Have you defended yet? Tuesday, I did, yeah. It was good. I made it. Thank you for <laughs> Yay. All right, well, thank you for listening. Thanks.